Welcome back to Sister Brunch, the podcast that brings you the stories and voices of Black women thriving in entertainment and media. And welcome to our fourth season. You can listen to seasons one through three on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're also adding a listener voice segment this season. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your voices. So if you've got questions about the entertainment industry or media industry, we would love to hear from you. Leave us a voicemail at 424-587-4870, and we might just play your question in a future episode. I'm your host, Fanchon Cox, and I for real could not wait to share today's guest with you on sister brunch because i am a huge fan girl i've been trying to get her on the show for like all three seasons before um i found halisa's youtube channel years ago when i was actually about to cut off all my hair and i was looking for natural hair care videos and uh, she came up she wears semi free form locks and has shared the whole journey of growing her locks and how she takes care of her hair. Um, and then suddenly I found myself pulled into her entire life. She's been making content on YouTube for 11 years. She's produced hair care videos and blogs, product reviews, a podcast about her marriage, Very Brave. We will get into that. And another podcast with content creators and artists. And most recently, she has created a web series with another very very famous YouTuber, Ellen from the internet, called This Could Have Been an Email. Halise was born, raised, and is still based in Texas, and she graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a BS in radio, television, and film. She's all about documenting and reflecting on her life, and that's why she created her YouTube channel, Halise. And she's a freelance producer, so we will talk about how she can juggle all of these things all at the same time, how she got her start on YouTube, and of course, everyone's favorite YouTube question, how does monetizing work? Halise, we are so, so thrilled to have you on. Welcome to Sister Brunch. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So like I said, we want to encourage our listeners and ourselves, everybody who works on the podcast, by talking about how you got your start. And I know some of it was that you loved doing photography as a young person. Tell us how that turned into this career. Yeah. So I first discovered photography when I was probably like in middle school. I went to a little place called Circuit City. I believe it does not exist anymore. (laughs) I went there and got my first, it was the last SLR camera. So it was the Nikon. I think it was the N75. That was the last SLR before everyone started going digital. And I bought that with my chore money. And I would just go around taking photographs of whatever was interesting with my chore money to, you know, buy the film and all of that as well. That eventually evolved into buying my first camcorder and just like documenting anything and everything I could, not realizing at the time that I was vlogging, essentially, in so few words. Um, And I would sit in front of the VHS and linear edit it together. (laughs) Obviously, this is before the days of nonlinear editing as well. (laughs) Yeah, I was out here. I was really wilding. Um, You were cut. Were you like physically cutting the film? Yeah, like uh, like so basically, like you would have the little mini tape in your recorder, Mm -hmm. and you would be in there like starting and stopping, you know, in order as you film, and then using your like your VCR to like go back and do it the right way as well. So linear. Yeah, completely yeah. linear analog editing. Yes. And that eventually translated into, I went to a, actually went to a magnet high school here in San Antonio that specializes in communications. And that was how I learned that I could turn my love of video and film into a full-time career and what led me to UT. And ultimately what led me to UT really was their um, UTLA program. I really wanted, my original goal in life was to be a feature film editor. I actually wasn't really trying to be on wow. YouTube. Very different journey so far. But yeah, that was really what brought me into like filmmaking overall. I actually spent some time in LA during my undergrad, realized it wasn't for me. and was like, ooh, I'm going to go back to Texas where I just know how to navigate things better. Mm. And um, just worked for traditional video agencies for a long time, but all the while having my YouTube channel to be a place to explore my creativity, document my own life, just experiment with things more with really more of the hopes of like finding community and also bringing those skills that I was learning as like a sort of independent, incredibly no budget filmmaker 
um, into my full-time agency work. Like I really was doing it just to like keep the skills up for the most part and expand them whenever I could. And now here I am. So it's, it's amazing. (laughs) And really, if you go to her YouTube channel, you see this growth and something I love about YouTube and now, you know, other options for us is that we're encouraged to grow publicly. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not just, you know, and there are plenty of folks on there that just come in and it's, you know, completely polished and they have a whole team with them. But I, what I find, what I love about your channel and, and other folks that I follow is just that ability to watch you learn. And then we learn from you. You just see that growth on your channel. You talked about being in San Antonio. And of course, you know, all of us on Sister Brunch, you know, we're, we're all based in LA and it's kind of like, we just feel like we have to be here. Have you ever felt pressure? I mean, you talked about that a little bit, but you were like, it's not for me. We won't be offended. We know why folks don't like it here. But do you still ever feel that draw to come and what keeps you grounded in San Antonio? I definitely do feel that draw to come for sure. I actually was just in LA this week for Adobe Max. So I was presenting over there for that. And then I'm actually going back to LA next month. So (laughs) I go there quite a bit, but Honestly, for me, it was just really hard when I went for my undergrad because I interned out there, worked on a lot of different stuff, but I could never really like get a foot in. I always reference when I talk to people about my love-hate relationship with Los Angeles, I always reference Chris Rock's Oscar speech, not this last one that got him Uh in trouble, but (laughs) not that one, Uh, but the last one he did where he was like, yeah, LA's like sorority racist. We like you, Rhonda, but you're not a Kappa. You know what I mean? And I was like, that is so exactly what it was for me. You know, it was just so hard to like figure out what the thing was that I just couldn't break through. Whereas ironically in Texas, by the time I had gotten to that point in my um, undergrad, I had built so many connections in Texas already. At the time I lived in Austin for school, obviously. So yeah, coming back to Texas after my undergrad in LA was done, I was able to kind of get right into it in Austin. And I stayed in Austin for almost, I think, like 10 years before finally coming back to San Antonio. But it's also fascinating because I'm actually thinking about transitioning the production company to Atlanta in June. Smart. It's interesting that you're saying this because I think one of the reasons that I I moved out here in 01 from the East Coast and everybody was like, you're not going to like it. You know, it's fake. It's, you know, racist. It's you know, all of those things. And uh, and superficial, of course, is the big one. But what helped me was that I had a lot of people from the East Coast. So I had that group of people. As you're talking, I'm thinking, you know what? I know a lot of people from Austin here, but they all white. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's it's a really tough move to make. Like, I think cost of living wise, it's just a really tough move to make because Texas's cost of living is significantly lower than California. You're saying you came from the East Coast. You know, if anything, it was more of an apples to apples, probably financial move for you. But yeah, my friends that I had that did stay out in L.A., it really like they're just now 10 years post undergrad getting actually really getting into their careers. Whereas for me, I came back to Texas and in like about two ish years, I was good. I was like making a solid, decent income. I wasn't I wasn't rolling in no dough, but I was doing all right. You know what I'm saying? So. Hey, it's Fanchon, and you're listening to Sister Brunch. We'll be right back. And during this real quick break, if you haven't done this already, go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Sister Brunch and Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. We are back and so excited to share more of our conversation with Halis. Halis, so you've built this incredible life that I think a lot of people would be envious of because you are kind of making your own story, right? Like you, and of course we all got to get paid. So we do some things sometimes we may not love, but you, you're kind of liberated in that way. Um, And so I want to know what is a day in the life of Halise look like (laughs) with that kind of liberation? Yeah, it probably looks very similar to most other people. I I mean, I try, like, I feel like if you work for yourself, you have to have 
a pretty epic amount of organization, control, consistency. So I wake up at like 6.30 most mornings, go for a run, then get to my desk. And I mean, a lot of it is just like sitting at your desk, you know, answering emails and doing things like that. Break for lunch, come back, keep going, editing, so on and so forth. I try... Over the pandemic, I realized I really had to like be very conscious about um, time management and learning when to log off. And so I try to have a hard stop at five, but Absolutely. recognizing that there's going to be ebbs and flows to that. Like sometimes you're just going to go over it because you just need to. Like there's times to grind and then there's times to chill for a second. So I try to let those waves come naturally. How about on shoot days or or even what's kind of your workflow or process if you're about to film the web series or film one of your videos? What does that look like? So, I mean, when prepping to film the web series, yeah, all of that consistency and time management goes completely out the window. It's all hands on deck until it's done. And I feel like I really just don't take a nap until it's done, you know? <laughs> So yeah, with that, I'm running around all over the place because it is a web series and it's an independent production. I think like with the last three episodes, I was the, you know, costumes person, you know, I was running around to stores doing that, like doing a lot of the sort of traditional independent producer things. Basically anyone you don't officially hire on for a role, you do. <laughs> right. Um, so it's, it's a lot of that. And then also yeah. the show is shot in Austin, not in San Antonio. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like scrambling to get things situated here to then go up to Austin for the next couple of days and work on it. Okay. So, yeah. So how about <laughs> fundraising then? So I'm in the midst of, um, I started my own production company and, you know, have all these, these amazing projects on my slate and yeah. I'm excited, but I ain't got no money. Like, right. so, so now it's like, okay, how do I make sure that I can pay for options or I can cover the cost of pitch materials? And how does that happen with someone who's a kind of an independent freelance producer? The short answer is thoughts and prayers. It doesn't really <laughs> <laughs> thoughts prayers and endeavoring to persevere <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. and and I would say actually in fact that's actually what I'm struggling with right now at the phase of the career I'm at because with the web series for example I was able to produce the pilot episode it was self-funded mm -hmm. um, and it cost about 20k to produce it but I was able to allocate those funds because I was an Adobe creative resident and so I had the full-time salary for that right okay. and I was able to move money to the show for that but episodes two and three were crowdfunded successfully. It was a successful crowdfund, so that was cool. But I'm actually at an interesting impasse right now because episodes four and five, season one is five episodes. Episodes four and five, I'm like kind of going back to the drawing book on funding. I feel, and this is, I think this might be because I don't have a traditional filmmaking background in regards to independent filmmaking, um, but I feel like it's over tapping the audience to do another crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel, you know That's what I'm tough. saying? I know. Um, I know. Because it is a big ask. And I think I'm very conscious of just where everyone is in the country right now. Like these gas prices is rowdy, inflation's mm -hmm. up there. And I don't know, for me as an artist, I think it's just because I come from like working class parents. I struggle with the feeling of, well, the art doesn't have to happen. You know, like this doesn't, mm. none of this has to happen. Yes. I just really want it to. So what's the difference between wanting and like needing something to exist? You know what I mean? I'm just going to say it has to happen with you <laughs> because I'm sorry, like, one thing I think a lot about is quality over quantity in terms of followers, in terms of views and right, all of that. And and I do want to get into kind of the what it's like to be a black woman on YouTube or on something that relies on algorithms that we know are racist, et cetera, sexist, et cetera. But uh, I find when I watch your videos and see who's interacting with you and how they're interacting, that you have folks that kind of rely, <laughs> rely on you. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you say like, I don't need to, I'm like, I think you do, not only because we need you, you know, the ways you inspire us, but also it's clear, as you said, from being a little girl, that this is the thing that you do. Could you see yourself doing anything else anyway? <laughs> 
Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> Evelyn and I both talk about like, well, I think when you're a content creator, you always like you always have a pie in the sky dream of what you would do if you weren't a content creator. And it's mm -hmm. always something that's incredibly offline. Mm -hmm. So like my thing is I would have a goat farm and I would make goat cheese. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's called yes. totes my goats cheeses. There you go. <laughs> and I'd just be chilling at the farmer's markets, you know, Saturday, Sunday, get Love this it. cheese, bro. You know? <laughs> So, but I'd probably still be documenting something, you know, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. It's mm -hmm. very, yeah, innate. <laughs> so both of you are having the experience of being influencers, being on a platform that is known for kind of creating stars, create, you know, turning folks into having higher platforms. And I get frustrated, honestly, when I see the views on your channel. Because I'm like, this is one of the best filmmakers on YouTube. So what is it like being bl a Black woman in this space? How do you maintain your commitment to continuing to do this when it, I can imagine, is not always easy? I think what keeps me on the platform is the community, for sure. That was why I came, and I think that's still why I stay. The other thing, don't get me wrong, YouTube does have things that it knows about and is actively working on. But I think the other thing that's been really beneficial for me has been that it's not necessarily been about the quantity of eyes that I have on my channel. Mm -hmm. It's always been about the quality of eyes I have mm -hmm. on my channel yes, and just who those people are because a lot of my independent career has just come from the fact that I existed on YouTube mm -hmm. and people were aware of that. Like I got a YouTube Creators for Change grant in 2018 when mm -hmm. I only had like 10,000 subscribers. I was not very big. And yet I got this opportunity to make a series of videos on my channel combating hate speech and xenophobia. Yes. So and then by the end of getting that, I also, again, was not very big and yet got the opportunity to be a producer of a channel for PBS for a whole like season, you know? So yes. it's for me, the gains have not ever really been about views or mm. subscriber count. Don't get me wrong. Mm. I mean, I know that I've been sitting at like 90K for the past like <laughs> year and a half. And I'm like, yo, I want a freaking play button, man. Yeah, but you need a play. <laughs> this is, I'm like, I, I'm waiting for the day I see a play button in the background. I'm like, where's I my know. Play? Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. But yeah, it's the community is really has what has kept me there and the high mm. value eyes for sure. Yeah. Because there's just so many great people I've met through the channel. That's been exciting. I do see Google slash YouTube making effort. That's nice to see, right? I mean, I know in the industry anyway, things have slowed down a bit since George Floyd was murdered and there were protests in the streets and they've gotten slower. But I do, I think we have to recognize that things are different than they were even prior to that. Like we're making some strides. It can always be better. I have a question for you actually about Please, that. Something, yes. something I struggled with with the aftermath of George Floyd's murder was... I did get an influx of new subscribers mm -hmm. of, I think, frankly, white people realizing they needed to diversify their viewing. Mm -hmm. And so then the struggle I found myself in was, are these pity views mm -hmm. or are these genuine growth, you know, community building views? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I um, know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Did you struggle with any of that with yeah, everything we, it was we like, struggle oh, so with somebody it. Had to die for me to get. I don't uh, want someone to die to get more attention. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, and and yeah. it is, it's back to that point of quality over quantity. Um, and we struggle with that with Sister Brunch. We're, we're very clear that this is about Black women and uh, gender expansive people, but that meaning that's who makes it and that's who it's about. But we're like every woman we have on, we, we're like the entire industry should be paying attention to these women. We purposely bring women on who, you know, if you say their name at an agency, the agents aren't, you know, may not know who they are. And we're like, you don't know what you're missing. At the same time, if they do catch on, you have to question all the reasons why they caught on, you know, yeah. there's certainly it's money, right? Because they, they, only if they see dollar signs. 
But to your point, I will take some guilt and shame follows if it means that I get closer to monetizing. Like you, y'all go ahead, you know, that's fine. Go ahead and follow, follow. And, but it is, it is, it's back to that quality over quantity. And ultimately you see that in who you're interacting with, who's coming back, who's leaving reviews while we're still in a place where the count does matter. I mean, I, I recently learned this because I was an actor for a long time in, in Hollywood and I was talking to a younger actor and when they're slating now to audition, you know, when they do the, my name is, they have yeah. to say how many Instagram followers they have when no. they're slating for an audition. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Oh no, but, that doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> And yet, if it matters in terms of you getting that job, you know, booking a national commercial so that you can do your creative work for a year or whatever, um, then those numbers matter. So what I love about you and your experience is that you continue to make things that are important to you and important to your fan base. You ain't changing your content for anybody. (laughs) That's a good thing. Well, that's also why I haven't grown, you know? (laughs) Yeah, well, it's a it's a give and take for sure. I used to have a YouTube partner manager. Uh, okay. She was awesome, but since she moved to a different part of YouTube, but she would always say to me like, "Holy, you're never gonna hit 100k because you need to establish a niche." And I was like, "Nah, man, the niche is me. I'm yeah, the niche." That's right. Yeah. And she would just chuckle. She would just laugh. She's like, "You're not wrong, but <laughs> we're both right. You are the niche, but also you're not the niche, and you're not gonna grow." <laughs> and she wasn't wrong. Hi, it's Fanshin, and you're listening to Sister Brunch. We'll be right back. And during this really quick music break, go ahead and follow us on Twitter if you're not already. We're at Sister Brunch and on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. I'm Halise, and you're listening to the Sister Brunch Podcast. Let's talk about some of that content because you are extremely brave in that you and your husband share openly about your marriage and um, struggles and what's that like and why did you decide to do that and how is that going? Yeah, I actually decided to do that because I had done, I had sort of trickled him into the YouTube channel a little bit, like pretty early on, like 2015, 2016, because it's like, how do you not have your partner if you're documenting your life it's kind of hard to not have your partner included in some way yes but at the same time i was seeing a lot of frankly what i felt was like fetishization of interracial couples Mm -hmm. that i wasn't okay with and so i was like okay how do i incorporate this person into the channel while still maintaining like my own individual authenticity with it but also like not having him be reduced to some sort of trope or just like almost like trophy husband look what I mm. like you know what I'm saying like mm-hmm. this odd colorism thing you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so yes. that was why I was like if y'all want to see more of my husband then it's going to be long form you are going to be forced to see him as a whole person yes. <laughs> yes. the good the bad and the ugly of Mr. Hollies you know what I mean yes. that's how the marriage podcast came about and we've taken a lot of breaks and hiatuses because for the longest time he was still like a professional nurse working in the field and people at the hospital did start to recognize him and he was okay. like this is weird I'm a pause hard pause <laughs> on this so yeah uh, but yeah uh, it's been good it's ha- and it hasn't been hard to share because for me I always I'm trying to seek out like the human experience like what does it mean to live and exist in this time in this place in this body like what does this mean and so that's why I document so much and I also seek out that content on YouTube as well yeah like I don't know if you know like Shan Boudram on YouTube as well I love watching her content her and I live live incredibly different lives you know she's like sex educator very open very just you know all things but i love watching her content because it's like yes i'm getting another version of a human experience and i just want to see that you know what i mean so i mean for that, me it's not that, hard to share it's, <laughs> it's just to me definition of a true storyteller and we when you know when we read scripts or or receive pitches it's so clear whether the person the writer has had the experience they're writing about 
it, you know, even if it's sci-fi or, you know, it's so clear if they've experienced kind of the, the life, you know, the universal types of life things that they're talking about. And it's a constant note, right? Like write what you know, and that is what you reflect, like your whole channel, everything you do is you as a storyteller, you being authentic in those ways. And it, it's truly a gift. Okay. So I'm going to set up a scene for you. So you, Halise, are in your favorite place for a sister brunch and you're having this fabulous sister brunch with the Halise that started her channel 11 years ago. What are you eating? What are you drinking? And what do you tell her? What am I currently eating and drinking? And you, what is you and she? you and you, the two of you are meeting now. Yeah, you can tell what are you both eating together? What are you both drinking together at the brunch? And what are you telling her? Ooh, so if it's a brunch, I'm actually eating something. And this is gonna, it's really gonna be all about our age differences because <laughs> her metabolism is still great and mine is not. Yeah. So. <laughs> so that's gonna you, be so you'll be of... some gluten free you'll definitely be having some gluten free for sure yeah yes i'll be having something gluten free that's high in fiber low in sugar because <laughs> yo this pre-diabetes is no joke like i'll be doing all of Listen. that i'll be having some white wine with no i'm not doing mimosas too much sugar mm -hmm. like i'm not doing it okay, okay. and she'll I, I can tell you what she's gonna be eating she's gonna be eating like chicken and waffles yes <laughs> <laughs> with a veggie you know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. some some grilled vegetables there as well because I was pretty balanced even back then and but she's like not really gonna have a taste for like decent alcohol yet <laughs> so <laughs> she'll probably like she'll probably still she, be having, she like, drinking moonshine what's she having what's she no <laughs> no she'll just be doing like the cherry vodka sour or something okay. you know okay. like yep yep something yes. like that yeah yeah uh, <laughs> That's what she's going to be having. Or she'll be having like a super duper sweet wine. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And um, and then your question was, what are we talking about? Yeah. What do you tell her? What do I tell her? I think what I'm telling her is, hey, girl, <laughs> it's okay that LA didn't work out. It's not you. It's them. I think I'm telling, definitely telling her like start the channel faster, like do it faster. Mm -hmm. It's also okay that the agency you're at is like incredibly problematic and your boss is scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's gonna fire you in a couple months anyway. You'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be so happy when she does. Trust me. <laughs> and then just like I know, actually, this is a good one because I was still pretty young in my marriage when we started the channel. It's like I know the marriage you. You went into it and you're happy. You, you know you made the right decision, but you're also like, oh, this is a lot. Just stick it out. He's actually really good. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> marriage, the, the transition to, into marriage is hard, but uh, you'll you'll be good. You'll be fine. It's just a transition. And mm -hmm. you'll get, you'll realize that those are normal. But yeah, I think that's like, ironically, it's not, yeah, it's more about like life overall. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'd probably be like, calm down on the sugar now because both your parents have diabetes. So like, it's coming for you. <laughs> it's all like health related. Start As getting, ooh, start getting facials now at your <laughs> That's not, I wish I had someone to tell me that to guide me in right. those ways. Yeah. I didn't get yeah. those. Halisa has been amazing and too short and for real. I got you in LA. Like I and I and I understand everything that you have faced. You are a true one. You are a real one. The industry just has not caught up with you. LA has not caught up with you. So you keep going. How can our listeners support you? And is there anything that you want to make sure we know? Oh man, no, because like we're Evelyn right and I right now are figuring out again what we want to do for episodes four and five okay. for the next of the project. This could have been an email, and of course I got a ton of other ideas, but it's like I should probably finish that one first. <laughs> so just I think just following is like the big thing. Okay. Like if y'all want to help me get to a hundred k. Let's do that. that. <laughs> Listen, let's do that. We're going to add that as a sister brunch goal for, for early 2023. Get at least to, <laughs> hopefully it won't even take that long. Hopefully. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. So good to meet you. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you for listening to Sister Brunch, the podcast that brings you the stories of Black women breaking barriers and bringing a whole lot of joy to the entertainment and media industries. Our mission at Sister Brunch is to highlight, celebrate, and uplift artists and change makers while also in our, in our own small way, helping to change the systems that marginalize us. As part of this mission, we are taking action to make sure that our guest list is more inclusive of Black folks of marginalized genders. So if you'd like to share your thoughts or suggestions or help support us in this area, please shoot us an email at sisterbrunchpodcast at gmail.com. This is our fourth season of Sister Brunch. You can read the transcript of this show and listen to all of our previous episodes at sisterbrunch.com. We so appreciate your support by subscribing to the podcast, leaving us a great review and sharing it with all the people that you love, especially with people who are interested in being in the industry or already in the industry and want to learn about new people, people they haven't heard from. You can also follow and interact with us on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast, and you can support Support the Sister Brunch podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing our show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or both or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Sister Brunch is brought to you by True Delo Productions. Our senior producer is Sonata Lee Narcis. Our co-producer is Brittany Turner. Our associate producers are Farida Abdul Wahab and Mimi Slater. Our executive producers are Christabel and Siabwadi and Anya Adams. We acknowledge the land we record our podcast on is the original land of the Tongva and the Chumash people. We cannot wait to share our next guest with you and take good care, everyone.